All right. How's everyone doing? This episode, I have no choice but to thank Plant Medicine. Thank you, Plant Medicine. This is a day that we have been preparing for. The stars aligned personally for me to be able to interview the legend, the DMT Jesus, the man who did the big figurehead study that reshaped the way we look at this specific molecule. It is a molecule that has been talked about, that might flood our brain when we die. It might give us our visuals in our dreams. Rick Strassman is a legend. Ten years ago, I was in a very dark place. I was in Hennepin County Jail. Good old Hennepin County Jail. And I was, you know, just contemplating life. Just, you know, in a eight by eight. Just, you know, twiddling my thumbs. And I go down to breakfast one morning and there's this guy who his name was also Nick and he had some serious charges and he was going to be going away for a couple decades but he was always so zenned out he was just so calm at all times and it's like dude what is going on Nick you're about to be going away for 20 years how are you always so calm he was always up in his cell meditating And the following morning after I asked him this, he comes down with a book. And that book was DMT, The Spirit Molecule by Dr. Rick Strassman. So I immediately, after grubbing up, I went and started reading it. I finished it and it was a long read. I ended up finishing it probably in like six, seven days. I just pile drove it and it reshaped the way I thought about the jungle mainly and this compound I needed to go experience. Now at this time I was not able to legally leave the country. I had been a felon for four years already. I was a felon before I even graduated high school. So I couldn't legally leave the country, but um, I was in a stay of a judification. So as long as I finished all my stuff, I was able to leave the country once I finished my probationary terms. So it was already implanted in my head. I needed to go experience this thing called DMT. 2014 rolls around. It's the end of 2014. I get let off probation, baby. I immediately go downstairs, file for my first ever passport. Sure enough, it comes in the mail. In like a month and a half, I'm not a felon anymore. Daddy can travel. I get it, end of December. I'll never forget this. It's the first week, first week of January. It's January 6th, I believe. I have no other options. I don't know where to even begin to reach out to go down to the Amazon jungle. I reach out to Aubrey Marcus, who's partnered with Joe Rogan at On It. I reach out to him, just a cold reach out on Facebook. Now, him and I had had some correspondence like a year prior um, after he had a deep ayahuasca session and was just in tears. He had lost his um, grandma, I believe. And I just sent him a message. This is like a year prior, just telling him, Aubrey, you're making such a difference on the planet. This world needs you. Keep your head up. And sure enough... Um, like a month later, I got a response from him just saying, Hey, Nikolai, thank you. I really appreciate those kind words, brother. Um, fast forward a year later, I reach out to him again, Aubrey, I am just a gringo who doesn't speak a lick of Spanish, but I got my first ever passport. I can now travel down to drink some ayahuasca. Where should I go? And He got back to me the very next morning. I'll never forget. I'm walking into a dead-end factory job that I definitely was not going to stay at. And uh, he told me exactly where I needed to go. 
um, Blue Morpho. And um, fast forward to February 19th. You know, and I get the winter blues like many people in the Northern Hemisphere do. And I go and I sit down with this Brazilian psychic named Jurema Silva. She didn't know me from Adam. I got set up from a friend who owns a beautiful soul. And Jurema sits me down. And my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, was there with me so she can she can vouch for all of this about midway through this session Jurema just gets this strong feeling mind you she doesn't know what I've been through she doesn't know that I read this book called DMT the spirit molecule and I had it set in my mind that I was going to end up in the jungle some way somehow she didn't know that a month prior I reached out to Aubrey Marcus after getting my first ever passport and he responded to me and told me where I needed to go she didn't know any of this she got a feeling halfway through this session and I still have the piece of paper to this day it said she wrote down Peru Circled it, starred it, pointed at it, slid it across the table and said, I just get the feeling you belong here. Tears start rushing down my face. This woman didn't know me from Adam. This is my calling. Intention was set. Mother Ayahuasca was already working on me. And it all stemmed from this book that planted the seed. And I owe so much to plant medicine. It's built this studio that I'm sitting in, this brand that has turned into my career, Stationary Astronaut. It has given me so much. It is blessed me with lifelong family, brothers and sisters and aliens that I am forever indebted to. It has sat me down with world leaders. And we all have a common bond, and that is unconditional love that comes from what we learn when we drink the brew or puff on the toad. DMT. It's God's gift. It's truly from another planet, from another dimension. And I have so many people and organizations that I need to thank. Honestly, um, Blue Morpho, uh, you gave me a blessing, Maestro Alberto, that your ecros sing to my spirit, and I still return back to them, thankfully, because I have them downloaded. Um, Hamilton Souther, who's been on the show, he is the founder of Blue Morpho. He was a crazy gringo who just made his way up the river and met Maestro Alberto and Maestro Alberto made him an apprentice. And then it brought us Blue Morpho. I've never drank with Hamilton. Um, Matt Toussaint, my uh, spiritual brother, he was one of my facilitators and shamans down when I was at Blue Morpho the last couple times. Um, Maestro Malcolm Rossiter, rest in peace. We lost him in 2018. His wife, Loretta. Um, big dog, Eddie Gonzalez. Uh, his wife, Cheryl. I met them my first year, and they just took me under their wing. They're veterans, and since then we travel and stay with them out in the hills of Santa Cruz. Uh, my brother, Keith Tyson, who was my first ever roommate there he had an inoperable brain tumor and here he is now he's still alive still kicking he's got a new baby um his wife is a sweetheart 
Um, he's alive to this day. Mark Flaherty. The astrologer himself also runs digital for Blue Morpho. Um, Carlos Tanner and the Ayahuasca Foundation. Carlos was recently on the show. Carlos is a gifted disciple of the medicine as well. Um, Soltara and the entire collective, Dan Cleland Mel, thank you for bringing me down there last year. I truly owe it to you. You know, I, I really do. I'm, I'm indebted to you, Dan. And congratulations on the new documentary with London Real. Um, Dan could definitely vouch that the medicine has um, given him opportunities that have reshaped his existence as he knows it and it has in turn reshaped countless others existences with how he's facilitated the medicine down there in Costa Rica at Soltara so thank you so much to Dan and Mel and through that I met uh, John Hazim who's a facilitator there as well I love you John um, thank you so much my brother Nathan Pohl who I met down there he's came up and visited and stayed with me and and uh, my brother Roman, um, <laughs> goofball Roman, uh, who I met down there at Soltara, he came up and stayed, came to the Where the Minds Meet conference with Dr. Gab Bormonte, Dr. Dennis McKenna, and Dr. Joe Tafer. Thank you to Dr. Joe Tafer as well. He's been a um, definitely a glue piece um, with who I need to talk to. And I can't forget Uncle Denny, Dennis McKenna, who has just been, he has vouched for me in so many joint emails, so many CC'd emails, or Dennis um, has told, you know, doctors at Johns Hopkins, just give this weirdo a chance. Talk to him. And um, he understands that we're all trying to do God's work. We're all trying to glow up together in regards to continuing the positive conversation um, without being a detriment to where the medicine can take us. Um, I'm truly indebted to these people. Uh, Nelson Lamb, uh, my first facilitator with the Bufo Avarius Toad, the Sonoran Toad, um, 5-MeO DMT. You will hear us talk about that early in this conversation with um, with uh, Rick and um, Jesse Gould and the Wounded Warrior Project. Jesse Gould is honestly doing God's work. He is helping wounded warriors, veterans who have uh, traumatic stress disorder, and he is helping to facilitate ceremonies for them where he is able to get them funding to get into retreats, which is changing lives, and that trickles down. He's not just saving veterans' lives, he's also saving their families. And we're talking veterans who have fought for our country. They have lost limbs for our country, uh, they have lost hearing. They have lost sight for our country. And they need this gift of plant medicine. Um, Gabor, Goofy Gabor, uh, Gabor the Labrador. This dude is, um, he is doing God's work too through literature and speaking. Um, Gabor's energy is just on A1. We are lucky to have Gabor, Gabor, sorry in our corner and i'm so blessed to be able to call him a friend um dorian yates mr olympia thank you so much dorian you give me that that um that warrior lion spirit i still to this day hear your your growls that came from a etherical place greater than this third dimension during ceremony and it lights a fire inside of me that I don't even think I've relayed to you so everyone the countless people the hundreds of people I've been able to share ceremony with thank you so much and we're not done yet um the micro dose is going strong people are awakening to the power of micro dosing psilocybin in the Western world, and we are capitalizing on it. Oakland, California, just recently. Santa Cruz, um, I believe uh, Denver. Uh, I think Chicago is going to get on, on board. Um, so many cities are getting on board. They're, they're skipping over federal legislation, and they're taking it upon themselves to allow 
for these plant medicines to be able to um, reshape the way we look at medicine. Thank you, plant medicine. I owe you everything. I owe you my life. I am indebted to plant medicine till kingdom come. And there is nothing, nothing that will ever sway me from this path. Uh, You have given me my purpose. You've shown me so much. You've given me my spirit animal. You have made me so aware of my faults and my imperfections and giving, given me a placehold, a baseline to be able to continue to work because that is one thing you universally learn is, oh boy, I've got a lot of work to do. But you were able and willing to grab it by the horns and execute. Thank you, Plant Medicine. Enjoy the show (laughs) with Rick Strassman. I'm so lucky. God damn it, I guess I'm a stationary astronaut now. And I'm gonna be high as a a fucking man. And now, the stationary astronaut. Uh, the psychedelic research is uh, becoming a growth industry. I'm, I'm really eager, and some of these questions that I'm going to hit you with, I am very eager to see where we will be at rather quickly within the next 10 years, just as corporations start latching onto this, and with hopes that they don't bastardize these plants and um, cause overconsumption. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, with any uh, powerful tool, the more widespread it is, uh, the more, uh, you know, adverse effects uh, might uh, crop up. Um, Break down the 21st century DMT renaissance we found ourselves in, Rick. Uh, Well, um, I mean, in a way... uh, it started with our work in 1990, uh, which was the first new American study in humans with these drugs uh, in 20, 25 years. Um, and we chose DMT because of a number of reasons, but uh, because of the papers that we published and especially the book I wrote about the behind the scenes account of the research, uh, DMT, the spirit molecule. And, uh, the popular independent documentary uh, that goes by the same name, uh, there's been a lot more interest in DMT, uh, both you know, scientifically and uh, among the public. How is it different than pre-internet DMT study use and awareness? Because Dennis McKenna, him and his brother, went down to the jungle because they heard about DMT and they wanted to um, find out more as research scientists and then they just came across patches of magic mushrooms and they realized oh that's what we were looking for the entire time so can you kind of break down what it was like pre-internet pre your study did anyone even really um was it widely known dmt um it was known uh, it wasn't that popular among the public uh and uh it was nowhere as uh, assiduously studied as LSD uh, during the first wave of human studies. Um, you know, but it was known for a long time. It was uh, you know, synthesized in the 30s, 1930s in Canada, uh, but was never tried. Uh, you know, then maybe you know, 15 years later, 10 years later, uh, it was discovered in uh, you know, psychedelic plants from the Amazon but it still wasn't known to be psychoactive. And uh, then in the mid-1950s, there was a psychiatrist in Budapest named Stephen Jara who wanted to study LSD, but because he was behind the Iron Curtain, he couldn't. So um, he you know, did some library research and discovered DMT, and he swallowed it. You know, he you know, took it orally. Um, after you know, synthesizing it in his lab, uh, and 
he could swallow large amounts and there was no effect. And he thought, well, maybe it needs to be injected. Uh, so Stephen Zara was the first person to experience you know, the DMT effect uh, in the West anyway. Um, yeah, you know, so it was a bit studied by Stephen Zara's lab in Hungary, um, a little bit in the U.S. And the thing that really gave it a boost was the discovery of DMT uh, in human body fluids, brain, lung, urine, spinal fluid. Uh, and so that uh, stimulated psychiatric research in terms of psychosis and schizophrenia. Uh, it, it was being used a little bit in the field. Uh, you know, Bill Burroughs, Allen Ginsberg, Tim Leary, and his group at Harvard, uh, you know, took it and uh, they wrote about it. It uh, was it was not painted in that you know beneficent a light. Uh, you know, one of Leary's, you know, subjects called it the terror drug and Allen Ginsberg hated it. And, uh, you know, Bill Burroughs was afraid of it as well. So it you know, was a mixed reputation uh, that it possessed uh, early on, the you know, 60s especially. Uh, but a very small number of people were using it as the businessman's trip. Uh, they could smoke it, you know, during, you know, lunchtime and then be you know, down in relatively normal uh, in time to return to, to uh, you know to work after lunch, um, it became a lot more you know, popular with you know Terence McKenna's uh, you know talks, uh, interviews, descriptions of its effects on his writings, um, but still it was you know relatively obscure uh, by the time we began our study in 1990. You know, so only a handful of our uh, you know, five dozen volunteers or so, um, you know, ever heard of DMT, ever heard of Terrence, you know, so it was still pretty much a clean slate. With it being considered the businessman's trip, do you see harm in the ease of accessibility of, say, lab-made DMT, i.e. kids using it in vape pens at festivals? Can that actually hinder the conversation from moving forward in a positive manner? Um, well, I think it's high risk for people to just, you know, use, you know, psychedelics, you know, whenever, you know, wherever and, uh, you know, with, you know, whomever. Um, but at uh, the same time, the adverse effects and the kind of uncontrolled use of the drug is going to enlarge, uh, you know, the discussion. Uh, because otherwise it's just, you know, kind of this, you know, narrow, you know, scientific, it's a really great thing to do with uh, a more expansive view of, uh, you know, what determines um, a good experience and what determines a bad experience. I'm always interested in well thought out thinkers, um, ground shakers in the philosophy department who experience a DMT trip, like say um, Tony Robbins, for instance, I've been listening to him and his experiences. It's always, um, it seems more introspective with philosophers and well thought out um, professors and MDs like yourself who experience where they can bring back a more, um, a more detailed uh, relay of the experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, so Tony Robbins is smoking DMT and talking about it? Yeah, he actually has um, drank ayahuasca and smoked toad. He wasn't too fond of the toad, but um, he actually was just on Mike Tyson's podcast, um, Hot Boxing, and he talked pretty, uh, pretty in-depth about his experiences with DMT, which is in insane because Tony Robbins is the, he is your, he is not your guru, you know? Um, well, he's not my guru, but he is a pretty popular guy. Uh, yeah, he, he's so got a documentary. He's got a documentary on Netflix called "I Am Not Your Guru," and it's kind of like an oxymoron mm -hmm. because he is so many people's guru. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's like saying I'm not Rick Strassman. No <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's important to distinguish between you know DMT and the active ingredient in the toad. 
Mm -hmm. The active ingredient of toad is called, you know, 5-methoxy DMT. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, 10 times more potent than regular DMT. You know, so it's much more easy to overdose. And the effects are quite different. 5-methoxy, you know, DMT is, you know, more commonly described as uh, making you, well, you know, kind of, you know, throwing you into the white light. Mm -hmm. uh, you, um, your ego's obliterated. You know, mm -hmm. There's no sense of self. Um, no content, really, mm -hmm. except uh, you know the emotional response, probably. Um, but you know DMT, which I, you know, which is the drug I studied, is you know very visual. Uh, it's you know full of content. Uh, there's not very often reports of the white light. You maintain your individuality. Mm -hmm. You're able to interact with what's going on there, think, make decisions, decide what to do, ask questions of the beings that are often described there. You know, so the you know, drugs are quite different. Um, you know, they both have you know, DMT in their name, but you know, 5-methoxy DMT, what Mike you know, Tyson is talking about and what it sounds like uh, you know, Tony, you know, Tony Robbins is talking about, you know, that's the predominant compound in the toad, you know, the mm -hmm. toad venom. You know, so when you know, people talk about smoking the toad, they're talking about 5-methoxy DMT. So with the white light experience, because I've only um, partaken with 5-MeO in the toad, 5-MeO with ayahuasca countless times down in the jungle, um, is there a reason why they would call 5-MeO DMT the god molecule? Is that the white light you speak of? Well... Yeah, you know, there was a, you know, there's a Hispanic psychiatrist, or maybe OBGYN, I think he's a, 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 a psychiatrist. Uh, I can't remember his name right off the bat, but a year or two ago, he wrote a book called The God Molecule, mm -hmm. and it's about 5-methoxy-DMT. And it's, it's interesting, you know, um, he came by here. Um, I live in New Mexico, and a filmmaker and you know, he were on tour and uh, they came by my place. And uh, I took him aside and said, you know, how do you define God? And uh, he couldn't quite, you know. Uh, you know, so I think, uh, you know, terminology is incredibly important uh, in this field. You just can't make stuff up and then start, you know, teaching it as the truth. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're going to call something the God molecule, you need to have a you know, a relatively sophisticated understanding to articulate the definition and the relationship between the two to be taken seriously. Otherwise, you're just kind of, uh, yeah, otherwise you're not really contributing to the, well, you're confusing the conversation, which I guess is a you know, contribution because ultimately you have to work to clarify it. But uh, it, you know, kind of, you know, muddies the water like, uh, you know, so I've been I've been uh, studying Judaism for the last maybe mm -hmm. twenty years or so, mm -hmm. twenty five years. You know, Jewish, uh, you know, philosophy, theology, and you know, whatnot. And um, you know, strictly speaking, at least according you know to that model, uh, you really can't perceive God. There's just no way of perceiving God. You know, God is imp imperceptible and incomprehensible. You know, so according, you know, to the Jewish you know, philosophers and to the Hebrew Bible, too, you know, there's a description in the Hebrew Bible of what's called God's glory, um, kavod. Uh, and uh, it appears to, you know, the Israelites, like the whole you know, camp of Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, it probably is the major component of the clouds, mm -hmm. the cloud of fire and the cloud of smoke. Yeah. You know, you know, during the revelation, you know, there was all this yeah. fire and clouds yeah. and stuff on top of you know, Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. You know, so those are all expressions of, of kavod, God's mm -hmm. glory. And if you look at descriptions of God's glory in the Bible and descriptions of the you know, 5-MEO experience, mm -hmm. they seem pretty you know, similar. Mm -hmm. It's you know terrifying. Uh, it's the white light. There's no content. Yep. Um, it's rather you know vague, you know perceptually and you know cognitively. You know, but it's overwhelming and it's you know it's uh, you know fiery and uh, quite 
quite over yeah it's it's quite over overpowering that's why it's called the glory um you know so i i think what you might be approaching with uh, you know, five methoxy dmt is the perception of the glory mm -hmm. uh of god rather than of uh you know god itself mm -hmm. Is it would that almost make um, their perception of God as like a verb, as almost like an action word? Um, well, I think it's more like the clothes, mm -hmm. well, you know, like the garment, okay. you know, like the uh, you know the uh, screen presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know the first thing you can see uh, that's not you know, God, but caused by God or a reflection of God mm -hmm. somehow. And, you know, then it you know, devolves into more, you know, formed content. With DMT being so prominent in so many plants in our salad we have for lunch and it's not able to get through our gut, what is that, the 5-MAOI inhibitor? That doesn't allow it to make us trip out on our lunch salad? What kind of salad do you eat? <laughs> I'm just uh, basically the main point of my question is with DMP <laughs> being so through the experience, you realize how perfect everything is. Okay. Through the geometric wormhole that you go through, even on ayahuasca oftentimes. And with that being the case and it being so prominent and so much vegetation. And I learned this in your book when I read it, what, 10 years ago now, um, would that just, and with how simplified the molecule is, would that just basically mean that God is in everything? Um, well, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, fully loaded. I got to hit you with there it. Is <laughs> DMT, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, there is DMT everywhere. Mm -hmm. well, well, not everywhere. You know, so you can't really say, you know, God is in everything if that requires the presence of DMT. You know, rocks don't contain DMT, but, you know, God is as much in rocks as God is in us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but, uh, you know, th um, there are many, many organisms that possess DMT. Um, every, uh, you know, mammal that's been studied so far, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of plants. You know, so it's ubiquitous within the natural world. Uh, so that means it uh, originated, you know, very early on in the in the chain of evolution. Uh, you know, Dennis McKenna's got some interesting ideas. I don't know if you uh, got into this with him about how far back the presence of DMT goes in the evolutionary uh, in the evolutionary ladder. Um, I really can't speak to it, you know, but the uh, you know, fact that it is ubiquitous, uh, it's just everywhere in the natural world, you know, seemingly, uh, you know, points to a, you know, very early origin. Yeah. When they were, um, when they were discovering older, still well, well put together bodies, um, when they studied the materials in the gut and they found just the vegetation that was in their gut, um, and some of the things that they were consuming led to the idea that they were having possible mystical experiences well before our time of understanding. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's possibly true. Um, yeah, and you were talking about the inactivity of swallowed or oral DMT. Yeah, it requires the inhibition of monoamine oxidase. Um, which is an enzyme in the gut, in the bloodstream, and the liver in particular. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, for ayahuasca to be orally active, DMT, it needs to be, com well, it's, you know, two plants. One contains the DMT, and um, one contains the MAO inhibitor that allows DMT to stay around in the gut long enough to be absorbed and to slow its metabolism, in a, you know, in the brain and the blood. Um, yeah, you know, so... It certainly is uh, possible, you know, likely anyhow, that, uh, you know, people smoke and nibble and uh, eat things, drink things that they stumble upon. And, uh, you know, that was the case way back when. And, uh, yeah, it isn't impossible to assume that uh, they 
eat certain things or smoke certain things for the you know, psychoactive effect. You know, the history of ayahuasca use in Latin America goes back, you know, thousands of years. So, uh, you know, it you know, probably goes back even you know, further than that. You know, one of the interesting things about DMT is it's endogenous. It's made in the human, uh, it's made in the human body. You know, so it's, you know, more, you know, likely in, in some ways that, you know, people experience religious exaltation or visions or whatnot uh, because of abnormalities in the production of their own DMT, you know, rather than, you know, finding an exogenous botanical source. Um, and that's actually, Dennis wanted me to ask you if you were familiar with John Chavez's work um, and his heavy focus um, on uh, just endogenous DMT within our body and getting to that state in a natural form or modality. Um, well, if you were getting there in a natural way or, mod or modality, the you know, goal that you were you know, seeking and that you might attain would be mediated, would be, you know, controlled through the exogen or through the elevated release of naturally occurring DMT. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's a very interesting question. You know, you know, what is DMT doing in the human body? And uh, you probably talked with John about that paper I was a co-author uh, for that came out of the University of Michigan uh, in 2019, demonstrating you know, synthesis of DMT in the rodent brain and uh, strong uh, circumstantial evidence for it occurring in the human as well. You know, so, you know, one of the most interesting aspects of that you know, paper uh, is that the concentrations of DMT were almost as high as the concentrations of, uh, you know, well-known neurotransmitters like serotonin. You know, so, you know, one of the uh, conclusions of that, you know, paper is that perhaps, you know, there is a, you know, a DMT neurotransmitter system, mm -hmm. you know, comparable to the serotonin system, the dopamine system. You know, so you'd have to wonder what that, you know, uh, you know putative DMT neurotransmitter system is regulating. You know, serotonin regulates, you know, mood, you know, dopamine, uh, you know, cognition, reward, you know, uh, you know, norepinephrine energy activation. You know, so, you know, what is the hallmark of the DMT effect? it feels more real than real. That's one of the most common refrains you'll hear people say. It was more real than real. Which makes you think, well, are there you know, systems in the brain that regulate our you know, sense of reality, which are amped up when you give DMT? Well, perhaps you know, the, the you know, naturally occurring DMT system is you know, somehow you know, regulating uh, our you know, sense of reality. Would that mean that we live in the biological simulation then? Well, I've wondered about that, uh, and it's really hard to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, yeah, two things. You know, number one, it would, it's, it's quite hard to tell. Uh, I mean, how would we ever know? But, you know, number two, would it make any difference? Yeah. You know, would we live our lives any differently? Uh, and that's probably the more important question. Well, and the coolest thing, because I, like I like to create my philosophical approach towards life and my understanding by teaming up books, okay? So I use your book as um, one of my spiritual Bibles, and I partner that up with a book that Joe Rogan really promotes. It's called The War of Art, where you send things out into the universe through hard work, and then the universe rewards you due to your hard work. You reap what you sow. In the third part of that book, they... Um, compare your guardian angels to Zeus's daughters, and they see to it that you reap what you sow. But then we, a lot of us, and um, James Arthur Ray, has, he's the author, co-author of The Secret. He's been on the show a couple times, and we've talked about that, just sending out your positive reinforcement into the universe. You do good, you feel good, good things happen to you. And that's where, like, when I start thinking of 
do we live in the biological um, simulation? It probably could be the case. We'll never have an answer, but I do know through personal experience, when I do good, I feel good, and I treat people right, good things seem to happen. Karmic rewards fall into place for me. Right, right. Yeah, the uh, your system isn't totally random, and we can learn how it works uh, and, uh, you know, do our best, you, you know, cultivate right beliefs and uh, interactively and, you know, creatively interact with your environment. Yeah, and, uh, you, you know, the way things are constituted is that there is reward and there is punishment, you know, for your actions. Mm -hmm. If you do good, you know, generally, you know, good returns to you. If you do bad, you know, generally, that, you know, bad things happen to you. You know, so you can learn, um, you can learn, you know, the system and uh, you can, uh, you know, get the most out of it. I kind of like it when you start using it to your advantage where it incentivizes you to pay it forward karmically where it's like, no, I'm just going to continue to do good, treat others well, treat my um, uh, other living species well. And then as I start reaping what I sow, it's like I have no excuse not to live that way. Um, well, you always could ignore the facts. I mean, a lot of people do and, you know, do whatever you want. I don't kill spiders, Rick, if that's what you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, uh, are you aware of the Wim Hof breathing technique? Um, you know, I've heard of it. Mm -hmm. I've, you know, never seen it. I've, you know, never, you know, read the details. It's all about um, pretty much stockpiling oxygen in our body through this breathing technique where you, you take in more oxygen than what you're letting out. And then it's allowed him and many of his followers to pretty much achieve superpower heights in regards to being able to climb Mount Everest with no shirt on, um, run marathons in the Arctic Circle, dang near nude, um, cold shock therapy, um, being able to withstand um, ice water for a very long time due to the um, surplus of oxygen you bring into your body. And I was wondering if DMT had anything to do with the over-oxygenation of your body. Yeah, I just don't really know. Um, you know, it's quite hard uh, to measure levels of DMT in the blood. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's impossible, strictly speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I think what you need to look at is, um, you know, the genetic machinery. Um, are the genes turned on? Are the end is you know the enzyme being produced, or you know the two enzymes you know, being you know produced at a higher rate? Uh, and you know, so far I haven't you know seen any data that have uh, correlated either DMT levels or um, the state of the genetic machinery mm -hmm. uh, regarding DMT production and the breathing uh, technique of Hoff. Okay. It might be something to look into because he's been a man who has been just studied by scientists across the planet and they pump him full of uh, this poison and then just how he regulates his oxygen and his blood, he is able to just basically pump this poison out of his body that normally it'd be toxic for somebody. And it's just, he's a superhuman and it's all based on this breathing technique. I just wanted to ask if you had any inkling where DMT might be playing a role. Yeah, I don't actually. Um, you know, one thing I you know, like to say or, you know, repeat is, um, you know, when it comes to uh, to non-drug altered states of consciousness, like your know, meditation, and I'm not sure if the Hoff technique induces an altered state, but you know, to the extent that any non-drug altered state resembles that brought on by giving DMT, it makes you know, sense that endogenous DMT would be involved. Do you see a day, Rick, where DMT and the plant medicine renaissance could unseat religion as we know it, possibly in our lifetime? Unseat religion. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, yeah. Well, well, so what do you mean, you know, to unseat religion? I mean, that's kind of a, a hot potato. 
Well, we quit putting faces on this force we perceive as God, and we just worship unconditional love and the force of it. You mean through psychedelics? Well, uh, you said it. I didn't, daddy mm. Well, you know, uh, over the last few years, if you read the, you know, the scientific literature, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, psychedelics do everything. They cure depression, end-of-life despair, tobacco use, alcohol use, wife beating, prisoner recidivism, nature appreciation, openness, meditation. I mean, you name it. Uh, you know, psychedelics help. So what does that indicate? You know, what you know, substance cures everything? It's a panacea. You know, panaceas cure everything. Yeah. And you know, how do panaceas work? They work through the placebo response. You know, they actually you know, cause results, right? You know, tumors shrink, de depression lifts, you stop using alcohol. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are real objective things. You know, but it occurs through marshalling the innate healing mechanisms of the mind. Mm -hmm. You give you know something and this weird combination of you know, processes takes place where you know somehow you know belief gets translated into you know biological healing so i think one of the primary if not the primary effect of the psychedelics is to enhance the placebo response uh and it uh it's important to look at psychedelics that way as being nonspecific. They can enhance the you know, beneficial effects of placebo, but also they can enhance you know, the adverse effects of placebo. Uh, and the most you know, salient example I, I like to bring up in that case is that of Charles Manson's use of LSD. You know, uh, and his way of administering it, you know, to his uh, you know, followers. You, you know, his you know followers were you know poorly formed you know psychopaths. You know, they had you know committed some crimes, maybe one murder before, uh, but you know they were kind of lost you know souls. But at their core, they were psychopaths. Mm -hmm. They felt like they had been ripped off by society, and they wanted to get back, and they didn't really care. Mm -hmm. about the impact of their behavior. You know, so Manson would, you know, give LSD to these people, and he inculcated this weird, you know, philosophy of helter-skelter. Um, and that's what the people, you know, wanted to believe in a way in the first place. And as a result of the LSD, they became convinced it was real. They were, you know, dedicated followers. You know, but... At the you know, same time, you give you know, you know psilocybin to somebody that's depressed and wants to you know, feel better. You know they aren't going to become you know, serial killers. Mm -hmm. And you give you know LSD to you know, Manson's you know, followers. Mm -hmm. You know nobody becomes a monk. You know mm -hmm. nobody you know goes back to medical school. Mm -hmm. You know so it's completely dependent on the person that takes the drug. Um, there isn't anything either beneficial or you know, detrimental inherently in the drug itself. It's this nonspecific, um, unconscious mind-brain uh, conflation, which then you know, manifests in what you're looking for, which is less depression or more you know, dedicated you know, psychopathic behavior. Well, you know, so your question about, well, will you know, psychedelics replace you know, religion? I think they could make you know religious people more religious, or people that want to be you know more religious. It'll help them become more religious. In the same vein, if you want to be a more you know merciless you know, murderer, you could take you know psychedelics in that you know setting with the, with you know that kind of goal, and become a more dedicated murderer. You know so. Um, it's not going to replace anything, but I think it's going to amplify the attainment and the pursuit of things that you're already uh, interested in and want to become. 
Well, and that solidifies the importance of set and setting too, correct? Right, right. You, you, well, when it comes to the ultimate outcome mm -hmm. of any psychedelic experience, you know, there's the three legs of the tripod, there's the set and the setting and the drug. I think you know, probably ultimately the one dispensable you know, factor would be the drug mm -hmm. uh, because it's, you know, who you are and what you occupy yourself with and with who that determines the direction of your life. You know, the LSD might speed that up. Perhaps you never would have gotten there in this lifetime anyway. It you know, might amplify it, let's say. You know, but the you know, raw ingredients are, um, are there. And uh, the you know, psychedelic can act as the catalyst or the yeast to you know, get things going. Tell me now, Rick, was Moses, was he high on DMT with the burning bush? Uh, well, I mean, Moses had a vision mm -hmm. of, you know, something on fire and an angel coming out of that fire. And, you know, Moses couldn't look at it. It was so intense. The angel said, you know, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Um, yeah, you know, so it, it was a DMT like vision in, you know, some, in, in, in some ways, you know, but, you, you know, but you don't have to, you know, postulate that it was, a uh, acacia, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sending off DMT fumes, uh, you would be on you know, firmer ground, so to speak, by uh, speculating an increase in endogenous uh, uh, you know, levels of DMT. Which could certainly be the case, because I think back to my dad on his deathbed when I was six years old, there was days where he was just pointing in the corner of the room saying he sees baby Nicole, he sees baby Nicole, and me as a little six-year-old, I'm thinking, what the heck is dad on? Meanwhile, baby Nicole was my cousin's twin that died at birth like eight years prior. Uh, yeah, it's very strange, and it's incredibly common, those kinds of reports. Well, you know, when my mom was dying, uh, you know, she was, you know, looking at her arms. Mm -hmm. Well, well, you know how you look at your arms and your hands, you know, when you're tripping? Yeah, you know, so, you know, so she was, you know, looking at her arms like, are these my arms and how weird do they look? And yeah, you know, so, uh, yeah, I think it's the, I, I think, you know, to the extent that a non-drug states like giving DMT, mm -hmm. there, you know, must be naturally occurring DMT involved. It's so interesting to think like um, experiences like that when you're of sober mind and someone who is, um, they're passing through and they have experiences like that. It's kind of like, there is no unlearning that. I will never not experience that. And seeing my dad have these visions where only he could see them in a dying state. Right. Right. And you have to wonder, you know, why that's the case. Mm -hmm. You know, why do we start, you know, tripping as we're dying? You know, why don't we, I don't know, start, you know, growing more facial hair or uh, <laughs> just, just become, you know, uh, you know, numb, stuporous, but, you know, but instead, you know, there's these, you know, visions, you know, what, you know, what's that about? You know, why is that, you know, what, you know, do those visions represent or mean? Um, yeah, you know, so the human body is configured that way, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it's the reflection, if you wish, or if you will, of intelligent design. I mean, it's there for a purpose. Do you think science as an institution will ever seriously consider spirit? Yeah, and the, you know, fact that, you know, science is only just you know now beginning to look at spirit for the first time in maybe four or five hundred years uh isn't that you know long a uh, spell in the course of history you know up until the enlightenment or you know the renaissance um you know there wasn't any separation between science and faith you know science explained the mechanisms of faith uh, you know, the way in which the spiritual, you know, world operated in the objective world. It was called metaphysics or, you know, theology. Um, well, yeah, it was, like, it was called metaphysics. It was a 
uh, conflation of you know science and of faith, you know, science and uh, you know theology, you know, revelation and reason. You know, so you know the natural, you know the natural, um, you know the natural world, uh, which could be described by science, was a reflection of uh, you know higher order spiritual uh, spiritual worlds, mm -hmm. um, and you know through the observation of nature, you can imply or infer. I never get that straight, mm -hmm. you know, but you can infer, you know, the operation of God's mind through studying science. Um, you know, the you know, medievalists would describe, you know, uh, you know, three different ways of attaining to the truth. You know, one would be through science, you know, through experiment, uh, ex 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 experimentation. And, you know, and um, one would be through prophecy, you know, through, uh, through a you know, firsthand revelation mm -hmm. uh, of spiritual tr truths. But you could attain to those same truths, you know, through science. Mm -hmm. uh, it was more laborious, more you know, trial and error, as opposed to the flash um, of you know revelation. You know, the advantage you know to science is that it's consensual and it's you know open to peer review. You know, prophecy isn't. You know, revelation isn't. Anybody can claim prophecy. Uh, you know, but if you're making your know, scientific claims, um, then you you know you know there's a lot more you know safeguards involved and you know that is the main reason i think f you know for the split of you know science and of you know faith you know back in the you know 1500s was because of the abuse by the church of the bible you know they were using it for uh, you know f you know they were using it you know for political purposes and just made all kinds of crazy stuff up and said that's god's word that's in the bible but it was pretty much only, you know, f you know, for their own uh, interest in, you know, political power. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, scientists and intelligent, you know, people, especially Spinoza, you know, said, you know, this is ridiculous. You know, why is the church, you know, telling us how things are in the natural world and in you know the social world? Mm -hmm. You know, we should just start thinking for ourselves, and the church could, you know, teach us how to, you know, believe if we want to, but. Uh, you know what you do. You know, medicine, science, you know, physics, chemistry, psychology. All, all those can be you know taken out of the control of the church. Um, so uh, I think as you know, science is you know looking at altered states of consciousness, uh, which you know back in the day was called you know prophecy or you know variant of prophecy. Uh, and uh, I think you know through the study of religious experience there's going to be a return of um you know science and you know hopefully uh you know more sophisticated version of you know religious um theology it's heartwarming because there is an awakening happening um this fall i sat down with the saint franciscan sisters now the saint franciscan nuns and sisters were the original nursing staff for the Mayo brothers here in Rochester, Minnesota. And I asked them in this interview, do they feel that the, our, our what, original Western alchemists, which were the witches, do they feel like they got the short end of the stick? And they laughed. And we're talking, these are sisters, okay? They actually agreed that, you know, the, the, the forest alchemists, the witches who were getting burned at the stake, they did get the short end of the stick because they were maybe uh, ahead of their time, poor se. Well, they may not have been ahead of their time as much as you know, threatening the control mm -hmm. uh, of the clerics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was really like this awkwardness went over the room before they started laughing. Because it was a pretty much, they were all in agreement, like, yeah, in today's day and age, with the understanding we have now, yes, they probably got the short end of the stick in regards to, you know, how they were, how they were healing people with their own modals. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, if you look in the text, the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible, you, you know, there isn't anything that says you know, 
you should not use plant medicines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're injured, you seek help. I mean, that's, uh, you know, you are, you know, there are, you know, healers uh, that aren't to be avoided. In fact, they are to be, you know, sought after to live longer and a more you know, healthy life. So um, I think what occurred uh, and still, you know, does occur, I guess, uh, is, um, you know, your religious organizations will take as much control of the situation as they can. You know, so if, you know, they can say you don't need medicine, you just need to pray. You know, that's not in the text, but they're just, you know, saying that in order to draw people into their, uh, their organization or their institution, their establishment. You know, so, uh, you know, that's why it's important to be familiar with the text and, you know, to not, you know, let, you know, clerics you know, tell you, you know, what is in there. Uh, you know, because, you know, the best thing you can do against, you know, religious you know, fanatics or, you know, totalitarians is confront them with the truth of, you know, their own religion. And uh, most, you know, people don't, you know, know uh, the you know, teachings of, let's say, Judaism or of Christianity, you know, you know, to be able to counter arguments that horrible behavior is justified by the religion. It, you know, rarely is. Rick, there has been so many um, stories and cases of supposed alien abductions in the middle of the night. Now, is this at a time when dimethyltryptamine is full-fledged in our brain, and are these people having psychedelic experiences? Have you even looked into any of this? Um, is, there any, is there any relation to dimethyltryptamine and alien abductions? Yeah, uh, well, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, you know, when I was you know, doing my study, like, you know, um, uh, well, well, before I began my study, uh, I was interested in interviewing people that had smoked DMT mm -hmm. in order to get a you know, sense of what to expect. Uh, and uh, I think I interviewed 19 people or so. And almost everybody described, you know, meeting beings in the DMT state. Um, and so I included that in my questionnaire, but I didn't think much about it until I began doing the studies. And at least, you know, half of the volunteers reported seeing beings. So I had to, uh, you know, look into that you know, phenomenon. And, uh, and obviously, uh, the most popular, you know, common non-drug situation in which beings are encountered is the alien abduction literature. So I compared uh, the descriptions of my volunteers with those included in John Mack's book called Abduction. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there were quite a few similarities. Um, you know, the vibration, the out of body, the interactional effects. Uh, so um, I speculated anyway toward the end of my DMT book that uh, it you know, could be that, uh, well, back up a bit uh you know when you're talking about encounters with uh you know the dmt beings there are clearly no stigmata uh there's no implants uh there's no you know kind of you know materializing 100 yards or 100 miles away you know but uh you know the descriptions are what i was interested in the you know conscious experience you know so if you want to posit uh, you know, contact with, you know, physical beings, that's one end of the spectrum. You could also speculate another end of the spectrum being, you know, consciousness to consciousness contact. You know, so I um, at least, you know, you know, raised the possibility that, uh, you know, some of the um, abduction experiences, uh, you know, could be, you know, cases of elevated DMT, uh, you know, bringing about uh, consciousness you know, to consciousness encounter, but um, still, you know, that's uh, speculative. You know, one of the interesting aspects is a lot of the abductions occur, like you said, early in the morning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, you, you know, the production of uh, melatonin, at least, made in the pineal is the greatest between around, you know, two in the morning, you know, to four in the morning. 
you know, we still don't, you know, know, you know, the circadian you know, rhythm um, of the brain's production of DMT. Mm-hmm. It, you know, could be circadian. It, you know, might increase certain times of day and, you know, be lower other times of day, of, of day. But, you know, that hasn't been worked out yet. And that was your initial interest getting into the DMT trial study was your infatuation with melatonin? Well, I was infatuated with the pineal gland. Uh, I really wanted to, you know, uh, understand its, you know, function. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was, you know, the 1980s, the early, you know, 1980s when I did my melatonin study. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was, you know, some information out there indicating that it was quite mind altering. Mm -hmm. You know, know, this, you know, was before it had been discovered, you know, that it was as good a sleep aid as it is. You know, you know, there were some scattered, you know, papers in uh, the literature describing, you know, psychedelic effects of melatonin, increases your dreams, those kinds of things. You know, so I, you know, thought the pineal gland might be responsible for mystical or spiritual experiences. And, uh, you know, melatonin was all the, you know, was, uh, uh, you know, just, you know, being studied, you know, carefully. Um, and, uh, there wasn't, you know, and there was not that much known about it. So, uh, I began, uh, you know, looking at, you know, at, uh, you know, pineal melatonin as, uh, you know, the way in which, you know, spiritual experiences might take place. You know, so melatonin in our hands and in our study was only sedating, mm-hmm. you know, but by then I had learned about DMT and then changed, you know, careers or, you know. You know, research interests. Yep. The um, you know thing about you know circadian rhythms of brain DMT, you know what uh, makes it go up, what makes it go down. Um, in that uh, you know, Michigan paper from 2019, um, it was reported you know that uh, brain concentrations of DMT increase quite a bit up to you know tenfold mm-hmm. in the dying brain of an animal that is you know subjected to cardiac arrest you know so there you know there you know, seems to be an elevation of endogenous dmt in the dying brain and it's quite you know tempting to suggest you know that the visions and you know the other experiences which people report in the you know near death state it could be mediated you know by that elevation in dmt now, there is a time, which is 3 a.m., they call it dead time. Would there be any correlation with dimethyltryptamine or melatonin possibly being in an awakened dream state at 3 a.m., why people are seeing more ghost activity at that time of night? Well, I mean, it could be, yeah, yeah. But until we nail down the circadian production of DMT, we still, you know, still speculation. Over the last couple of days, I've been revisiting your literature, especially in DMT, the spirit molecule, and um, I, I came across something that I, I had actually forgotten about. You claimed in your book um, that the spirit might enter the body 49 days after conception. Do you still believe that? And will there ever be a day where we can prove it scientifically so we can maybe have a definitive timeline when we can abort a fetus? <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's a tricky one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, y- y- you know, keep, you know, uh, yeah. Well, so keep in mind that I came up with that, you know, theory in my 20s. Yes, which uh, is so, why I asked. You know, yes. Youthful enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah, you know, youthful ab- abandon, yep. intellectual <laughs> recklessness. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, um, I developed that, uh, you know, theory because of a, you know, the you know forty nine day coincidence you know the pineal gland first is recognizable in the human embryo at around forty nine days and you know the differentiation of the gonads into you know f- in into into you know male or into female uh is you know pretty distinct on that forty nine days and you know the tibetan you know buddhists and you know buddhists you know worldwide but especially the tibetans have you know worked out this you know system of uh, the transmission of one you know, soul, you know, to the other, you know, somebody dies and their you know, soul is you know reborn into another body, 
which occurs after 49 days. So I figured, you know, 49, 49, 49. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, the soul of the you know, previous incarnation enters through the pineal at, you know, 49 days. You know, there's the spirituality, you know, sexuality dichotomy that's, uh, you know, well known, uh, you know, tantra or, you know, celibacy or, you know, those kinds of issues. So uh, it's a, you know, tidy package. Um, you know, you'd have to determine that the pineal gland in the 49 day embryo is producing DMT. And we don't have any evidence of that at this point. Um, you know, so the, you know, that would be the first stage in proving that theory. Well, and, time, you know, time besides to that, you study. would need to uh, identify the soul. You mm -hmm. know, like, you know, how do you measure the soul? You can measure its activity, let's say, you know, theoretically through this blast of pineal embryonic DMT. You know, but that's, you know, just, you know, the reflection of its activity. You're really not, you know, measuring or, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, seeing the spirit itself, you know, just its effects. It's so interesting because there's so much to unpack in regards to everything that surrounds the idea of the spirit. So there is, it's going to be probably an infinite study that's going to need to take place just so you can, with this journey that's being embarked on in regards to the world of psychedelia, the studies that go along with it, and what the heck is the spirit even? Right. Uh, what is the spirit? Um, well, it isn't like we need to reinvent the wheel. There's been a lot of great minds that have applied themselves to understanding what the spirit is and, you know, proving it or disproving it, you know, where it comes from. It's, it's speculative, of course, but it's, you know, metaphysics. I mean, these people weren't idiots. You know, they were physicians, they were scientists, they were alchemists, you know, they were you know, philosophers, politicians, you know, the giants of their generation applied themselves to understanding what's the nature of the spirit, what does it you know, say about, you know, uh, the you know, source of the spirit, you know, God, you know, the way in which an immaterial, incomprehensible God interacts with a comprehensible, perceptible world. Yeah, um, you know, that's been worked out. And I don't think we, you know, need to just, you know, throw up our hands and say, you know, what is it? You know, we can go, you know, back to, uh, you know, when you know, science and you know, theology were quite closely wedded and, um, you know, revisit, you know, some of those theories and, you know, see if, you know, modern you know, technology can um, put some of those ideas to the test, in which case you would be experimenting again. You'd be doing research. You would have empirical trial and error studies. You can modify your theory based on your data develop new theories that would generate new studies and you know, so on you know so in the prophetic states book i wrote in 2014 which compares the dmt state and that of you know, prophecy uh i call for a you know resurrection or you know re enlivening as it were of, of you know of uh you know, medieval metaphysics mm -hmm. uh you know we should you know look at those you know, theories and uh, are they valid? Can we, you know, can we test them? So do you think corporatized Western medicine is even ready for that conversation? Uh, no, but, uh, <laughs> that doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, people are going to do what they want to do. They're going to believe what they want to believe and they'll try and make money any way possible. So uh, there's, you know, no stopping progress, you know, but in uh, the meantime, uh, you know, higher minds could apply you know, themselves to, uh, you know, more basic, you know, questions, mm -hmm. you know, than how to monetize it. I had two people who have sleeping di sleep disorders who wanted me to ask you this question. Um, is there a correlation between the lack of tryptamine or tryptophan and insomnia? Well, I'm not sure um, about the mechanisms of insomnia. I mean, there's quite a few. Mm -hmm. You know, but, you know, one of the helpful ways of uh, making you sleep, you know, like a good sleeping pill is L-tryptophan. Mm -hmm. And that's because of its conversion to serotonin. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in the brain, which uh, will, in some circumstances, um, make you sleepy. So I don't think it's through, and it, it even you know could be you know through melatonin production, which begins with tryptophan as well. But I'm just not. I'm you know not that you know, familiar with the you know with the literature, uh, you know the you know, current literature, you know. But L-tryptophan is a good sleep aid, so uh, that uh, is the case. I've got one last question for you, Rick. I've already taken up too much of your time, and um, I just want to before I ask you it, I want to express my gratitude, my appreciation for you being the 21st century incarnation of Jesus Christ to my generation. You are the middleman between God and the common man. And I just have to express my, um, my thankfulness to you because honestly, you have helped change my life 10 years ago. I read your book while I was in a very dark place in my life. Um, it was out of fate that I even came across your book. And uh, it changed my life forever because five years later, I was flying down to the jungle annually, annually and really getting to experience what this thing we call life is all about. Oh, well, great. Well, thanks. Glad to be of help. <laughs> I blame it on you. <laughs> because well, literally, literally the, this, the stationary astronaut brand came from my experiences on the mat in the middle of the Amazon jungle. And then for me to come across a, another book, you, I believe you co-wrote it, uh, called Inner Paths to Outer Space. That is the literal um, metaphor behind Stationary Astronaut, where you're, you have to go deep within to be able to reach the stars, to be able to accomplish goals, to be able to access anything you have to make the decision within yourself to write a book to go jog a marathon to accomplish anything yeah yeah it's uh it's it's a good idea uh it it you know, captures a lot inner path to outer space rick tell us the story of your most in-depth groundbreaking paradigm shifting personal psychedelic experience well, I mean, you know, for a you know for a long time, I would say, well, you know, I'm no zealot. I've never taken drugs, uh, you know. But I am talking about the first time I smoked DMT, which was with Terrence McKenna in uh, in the in uh, the 1980s. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, it, it changed my life. Uh, you know, he you know gave me the the pipe, as it were, uh, and uh, you know, I took all the hits I possibly could and uh, kind of opened my mind's eye and there's this huge blazing waterfall uh, of you know, colors and out of you know, the waterfall you know, came these little beings about three to you know, four feet high maybe half a dozen of them and you know they looked at me I looked at them and they said now do you see now do you see now do you see like over and over again you know now do you see and my poor mind was just shattered uh, but that you know, question just you know, kept on pouring into me. Yeah, you know, so that was my first major, first and only, you know, my only experience that I, uh, at this point, still feel comfortable you know talking about. But uh, yeah, it uh, you know kind of you know set me on my course. And it was with one of the Godfathers. Did the, when they were saying, "Now do you see?" Please tell me it came through in Terrence McKenna's voice. <laughs> No, no, it you know wasn't audible. It was just you know telepathic, yeah. like they were just you know boring this telepathic message into my mind. That's the most um, interesting thing about all of my insight that I've gained from ayahuasca and five meo is it's always been telepathic. There's never really been. Yes, my auditory is is definitely enhanced, but it's always coming through telepathically. Yeah, the spoken voice is rare, at least uh, in my experience, the spoken voice on psychedelics. You, you know, there are other compounds which do produce a spoken voice. The anticholinergics in jimson weed or loco weed or datura, 
you know, they also have anticholinergic you know, drugs in them, mm-hmm. scopolamine, you know, hyoscyamine. Um, and, you, you know, those produce a spoken voice a lot more often than the tryptamines or, you know, lysergamides do. So um, I think, you know, that's an, an area for future, you know, for future studies is, you know, you know, what is, you know, mediating the spoken voice. Is that why an early name of dimethyltryptamine was called what telepathy? Uh, well, telepathine uh, was the name of one of the beta carbolines, one of the monoamine oxidase inhibitors found in ayahuasca. Okay. Uh, you know, they didn't really know if it was the beta carbolines that were psychoactive or the DMT was, and because of the reports of you know, shared consciousness or, or, you know, telepathy, uh, they called, I think it was harmaline, they called telepathy, uh, which was, you know, before they knew more about the chemistry. Oh, Dr. Rick, thank you so much for taking this opportunity on my end to um, just expand consciousness and to share your story, share your knowledge. As I stated, I wanted to hit you with outside of the box left field questions that I hope you have maybe not heard yet because I really like to advance a unique style of conversation and it is a big ups to you for taking this call. Uh, well, my pleasure, Nick. Is Yeah, yeah, um, a lot of the questions were new and good. Yeah, um, you know, so I always like to uh, have these kinds of talks. <laughs>